Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeremy Rahman, and I am a member of the Evo Endo marketing team, and I will be your behind the scenes moderator for this evening. Just a few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. This webinar is scheduled to be one hour in length, and we have reserved some time at the end for questions and discussion. Speaking of questions, you can type them into the chat box by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the viewing window. Only you and the panelists can see what you've typed in. We will then anonymously read them aloud to the group. If you'd rather ask a question or share a comment aloud, please click on the raise your hand icon. I will acknowledge you by name and then unmute you. You can turn your web camera on if you'd like, but I'll leave that up to you. For now, everyone's line is automatically muted to keep the background noise and feedback to a minimum. Please stay on mute until called upon to prevent interference. We will share a recording of this session with all registrants via email in the coming days, so please make sure to keep checking those inboxes. Now, with all that out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our host this evening, our physician founder and chief medical officer, Dr. Joel Friedlander. Take it away, Joel. Thank you so much, Jeremy, and thank you to all of our attendings this evening. All of us at Evo Endo are so honored that you are joining us. We want to thank everyone for coming to our second Evo Endo webinar on sedation-free endoscopy. As a company dedicated to evolving endoscopy, i.e. our name, into the 21st century, we are hoping that this series helps prompt good discussions to help bring a better endoscopy experience to our community. As part of our ongoing series this year, we will be featuring a variety of speakers and guests around the United States and the world discussing various topics ranging from different medical disease states that endoscopy can be used for, ideal methods to optimize and establish a sedation-free endoscopy program, and experiences from medical team members about the ideal way of treating and diagnosing their patients. We promise they all love picking each other's noses. Remember, you pick your friends, you pick your noses, but only t &E experts can pick their friends' noses. Tonight, we are very excited and honored to have a very special guest, which we will introduce shortly. Next slide. As you are aware, I'm very honored to be part of Evo Endo, a startup based out of the mile high city of Denver, Colorado, and was one of our co-founders of our company dedicated to bringing a sedation-free endoscopy experience to our patients and improving patient care. When I was in medical school, I never truly realized how each of us has the opportunity to transform not only the care of our individual patients, but help other providers and physicians as well. When our co-founders all started out as an air digestive team in 2011, none of us knew the power of medical innovation and how hard the work would be. Evo Endo established in 2017 has truly been a team approach and a collaborative effort to bring our experiences, our ideas and new devices to patients and providers around the world. Our team's dream became a reality when Evo Endo's ultra slim endoscopy system was granted FDA clearance 510K for patients five years of age and older on Valentine's Day in 2022. As of today, over 12 medical systems are now utilizing our devices, training systems and methods to help improve the care of their patients. We want to thank those healthcare systems. Over 280 cases have now been performed around the United States. Thank you for all your support. Next slide. Our system includes an ultra portable controller that is less than two pounds and a, ster a single sterile 110 centimeter length gastroscope that enables sedation free endoscopy, transnasal esophagoscopy, transnasal esophagogastroscopy, or transnasal EGD based on the patient's needs. The device also enables the endoscopist to obtain biopsies with readily available biopsy forceps and navigate the upper GI tract with the full capabilities and functionality of a much larger gastroscope. Next slide. The team at Evo Endo is dedicated to providing the services to help others evolve their patient's sedated experience to sedation free or help others think through the possible uses of an ultra slim endoscope that could be used in their practice. The sedation free option may help decrease the patient's time needed for the procedure, no general anesthesia is needed, and improve the time to a medical diagnosis. It also has the potential to open up access in a medical center. Many health systems have found Evo Endo's system that features an optional virtual reality patient experience kit also creates a well-rounded patient and family-centered experience. Next slide. To briefly review the world's thinnest single-use gastroscope, it has features that were built around our clinical team's experiences and needs for an evolved sedation-free endoscopy. It was designed to be an ultra-portable and always be available without the concern for washing or breakage in an office setting. 
Being a Colorado-based company, we also wanted to make sure it has the potential to be recycled if the medical center has such facilities. The single-use sterile endoscope provides a three and a half millimeter outer diameter for the smallest of nasal or other anatomy. It has a wide 120 degree field of view and 110 centimeter length to allow for full transnasal or transural EGD with or without a biopsy. It also enables other diagnostic or therapeutic procedures requiring an ultra slim profile, including tube placement. It has a slightly stiffer shaft and four-way steering to help navigate the floppiness found in other ultra slim scopes. And of course, air, water, and suction readily available to help clear the upper GI tract secretions. It was a dream come true to help develop this system. Our team thanks you for attending our webinar today and consider bringing the system to your medical center. Next slide. I'm now honored to present tonight's speaker, Dr. Tom Sfera of University Hospital's Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. As the division chief who saw the potential sedation free endoscopy could have it several years ago, he pioneered and helped his team bring the technology to his practice. His first faculty member, Dr. Rame Sabe, has now trained subsequent sedation-free endoscopists, and the patients of the Cleveland area now have the option of sedation-free upper tract endoscopy available multiple times per month. Thank you to Dr. Sfera for his support and advocacy of this technology. As part of this work, Dr. Sfera navigated the health system, developed his faculty, and navigated the complex economics that so many of us in medicine have not learned much about. He has very unique insights, approaches, and perspectives, and likes to help others bring sedation-free endoscopy systems like Evo Endo to their, to their health center. I would now like to introduce Dr. Tom Sfera, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us this evening. Dr. Sfera? Thank you. I'm ple quite pleased to, to be here and to present this evening. As, as Joel pointed out, that this is a something that we've spent several years on, and a lot of angst and hard work, especially by Dr. Sabe, who brought it to fruition, and our endoscopy team, and quite frankly, our administrators, who really worked to make this a, a very viable program that we continue to expand each year that we've been active doing this. So for to, today's presentation, I hope that at the end of this, I would have achieved these objectives objectives for each of you that you would be able to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of sedation-free transnasal endoscopy, be able to describe the facilities, equipment, and training required for sedation-free transnasal endoscopy. You should be able to list the CPT codes used for this procedure, assess the budgetary implications of sedation-free transnasal endoscopy, and be able to formulate a proposal for a sedation-free transnasal endoscopy to present to your institution and hopefully be able to avoid some of the the the, the stumbling blocks that that we we ran into as we were bringing this uh, to our institution. So first, the question will be why start a sedation-free transnasal endoscopy program at your institution? So let's look at the advantages. What are the advantages? for sedation-free endoscopy, and we're going to consider the, the patient first in this slide. First, there's a reduced or elimination of exposure to anesthetic agents. There's a reduction of sedation-free related complications for patients undergoing multiple uh, upper endoscopies. You have reduced costs to the patient. There's no need for intravenous access. You have less total time spent at the institution. The patient is in and out in a shorter period of time. And there's no need for reduced activity post-procedure. I see this as quite an advantage, especially for our, our patients who are children who are attending school. They're able to have the procedure in the morning and make it to class for the afternoon. And those who are participating in athletics have no restrictions. They're able to immediately return to physical activity. And I, I think another advantage for the family is a parent or a caregiver does not have to be concerned that the child is, is awakening from anesthesia. They would be quite comfortable if they're a teenager being at home if they didn't want to return to school while the parent is able to return to their work or other activities. So just a quick slide on the patient time, the advantage to the patient that they're actually in uh, the institution uh, undergoing a transnasal endoscopy versus a sedated EGD. Here is from a paper that Dr. Sabe published of his uh, early experience at our institution. And as you can see here, this is the patient time, it's the median 
time with the intraquartile range, range and then the total range. For an upper end, a sedated upper endoscopy, the patients were on average over two hours at our institution, two and a half hours, with even up to 250 minutes. But for a sedation-free transnasal endoscopy, the median patient time was at the institution was just over a half hour, and very few, obviously no patient exceeded an hour. So the longest was one hour. So this is quite effective for our patients to be able to move in and out of the institution. So what are the advantages then for sedation-free endoscopy for the institution? You're providing good patient care. There's a potential for reduction in medical costs to your institution. You're having expanded services. You have something additional you could offer and perform. There's increased efficiency in doing this as the, the time is shorter. There's improved patient satisfaction, clearly by offering alternatives to care that they could choose to undergo. And it may complement uh, your existing uh, or developing programs, such as an EOE program or aerodigestive program. So we mentioned that there's increased uh, EGD efficiency. So how, how is that even possible? The three keys here are the, there's more patients could be scheduled per endoscopy block time. The, you can do these endoscopies at an alternative site. And then more patient slots at the primary endoscopy location if you move the patients to another site. I'm going to explore each one of these a little bit further in the subsequent slides. So the more patients per endoscopy block time. Since there's no need for post-sedation recovery, there's also minimal time for room turnover. And you're in and out of the procedure room more rapidly. So you're able to schedule more patients instead of a restriction to a certain amount of time where you, the patient has to be undergo uh, anesthesia or sedation and then time for recovery. So this allows you to actually schedule uh, uh, more patients. Also, if you use an alternative site for the endoscopy procedure, your efficiency can go up. So the the, 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 these transnasal endoscopies do not need to be performed in your main endoscopy location, thus removing the burden of that, of that location. Since there's no need for sedation or anesthesia, you could go to a different site. There's no need for high level uh, disinfection support if you're using the transnasal gastroscope. And again, it could be performed in a very low acuity setting, such as a clinic or an ambulatory office type setting. And a key, I think, is that you could schedule, if you have an alternative site that you're doing these procedures, you could schedule more patient slots at your primary endoscopy location. Here I would have, let's imagine this would be an operating room where you have uh, four slots. If you're able to perform some of your endoscopies at another location, you open up a slot where additional patients, perhaps high-risk eye acuity uh, patients, could undergo endoscopy. Again, increasing your total uh, EGD efficiency overall. So, so now you've decided that, yes, we have a need and we want to, to uh, start a transnasal program at our institution. So how do you go about implementing this the uh, sedation-free transnasal endoscopy program? So first, you need to meet with leadership and discuss the possibility of beginning a program. Uh, that may be your division chief, or if you're the division chief, you may need to discuss with your department chair or go on to your hospital president to have the discussion. And in that initial discussion, there's some things that you will want to bring up and discuss. First, what's the national picture of transnasal endoscopy, of sedation-free endoscopy? They're not going to be aware of this in most cases, so you need to review it. How many centers are doing these? Are, discuss the interest group, that there are meetings, people are talking about this at a national level. There are many papers that have been published and several more that are coming out. And again, at our upcoming NASPIGIN meeting, I anticipate several meeting abstracts that discuss sedation-free endoscopy in children. Then also be aware of what your closest competitors or peer institutions are doing. Or do you need to have this program just to keep up with them? Be prepared to present the benefits and need for the program 
and also discuss the challenges that you're going to have to starting the program. If you don't have these outlined, again, most uh, leadership will say, I need this information before we could give you the okay to go ahead. And so what you may want to come in with, and I don't want to scare anyone away, is to do a SWOT analysis. This is many of us uh, just cringe when we see this because we've done so many of these. This is where when you're putting together a program, you analyze your strengths, weaknesses, the opportunities and threats to that program. Here are some examples that may, you know, may be used for a sedation-free endoscopy program. First, your strengths. You have interested and skilled endoscopists. You can implement this. You have a large patient population. You have uh, a large uh, number of patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. You have a robust aerodigestive program. You have space available, perhaps, and you may have equipment available, meaning the bronchoscope and the cart that would have the equipment to carry them. What are the opportunities that you can increase in patient satisfaction? Or as stated, the benefits enhance your current programs. You may increase, receive increased referrals and second opinions from other centers. It can enhance fellowship training. We're learning our fellows are very interested in learning this and we feel that it's, it's helpful. It's gonna help our fellowship program even grow. And also you may see an increase in the number of endoscopic procedures. And then finally, what are your weaknesses? You have to be clear about these. You may have no experience with the procedure. You don't have equipment, the uh, availability of bronchoscopes. You may not be able to have purchasing power to, to bring in new equipment. And then you may have limited space for the procedure. Then threats are what your, uh, that your competitor has or is beginning a program. You need training. You have a cost of the equipment. And then you're shifting of revenue streams. And what I mean by that is that if you are doing these procedures in a different location out of the operating room, you are moving revenue that would flow into the operating room out of that, that venue into another area. And that may, uh, may be a threat to, to part of your institution. So now that you've reviewed all of this and met with leadership, and you got the okay to go ahead and start the program. You're gonna to need to start the program and how do you start? Because you unlikely will get help in the initial uh, st startup. They'll wanna see how far this could go before they have to either put money into it or really put some effort on their part. So for you to move forward with program development, you need to identify and meet with your institutional stakeholders. And that would be, if you haven't discussed it with the endoscopy medical director, your endoscopy supervisor, directors and managers of the units involved. Can you uh, set this up in your endoscopy unit? Are you moving things out of the operating room? Or if you are thinking about doing this in a more ambulatory clinic setting away from your main institution, do you have the support of managers and directors of those locations to be able to set this up? So then you wanna go through this, you need to define what resources that you need. You need space, a room, a location, where are you gonna do this? Do you have the tech, technician or nursing support to perform it or does someone, has to, does someone else need to be hired? Again, if you are doing this on the same day that you may have ongoing endoscopy, there may not be adequate support staff to do this. What equipment do you need? A bronchoscope, are you proposing to do, use the transnasal gastroscope? You need a chair for the patient, a cart for the equipment, and then virtual reality goggles or a, tel a television in a room to provide distraction for the patient while they're undergoing the procedure. So this is how we've eventually set up our room. Uh, we were fortunate enough when we started that we did have an empty endoscopy space in our endoscopy suite as we moved our procedures years ago to the operating room. So here we were able to set that up. And then this is a close up. Our cart is set up for um, using a bronchoscope, but also the Evo endoscope, which is hanging here. And it's quite small. The, the, the equipment for it is smaller. So you would not need a full endoscopy cart to do these procedures. We just have it because we also have our recorder on it and everything. This is our full endoscopy cart. And quite frankly, though, this chair 
that we use. We found this that was in storage and we were able to bring it in. It was an old EMT chair. So almost looks like a barber chair, but we were able to do a lot by just scavenging equipment and bringing it in. So now you have everything and you know where you want to go. You need to develop a business plan. So you're going to work with your administrator and endoscopy director. They'll do the heavy lifting, do the, the spreadsheet, do a lot of the calculations and the depreciation of equipment. That's what your administrator should be asked to do. You'll, with the administrator and your endoscopy director, will determine a uh, location. Where could this be performed? Then you need to have your list of equipment needs. This is, since you're proposing this program, or do you want to use a bronchoscope or TNE gastroscope? Obtain the costs and quotes. Your endoscopy director would be responsible and helpful for that. And then your responsibility and your team's responsibility, along with your chief, is to estimate the number of patients who will undergo this procedure uh, on a yearly basis. They'll want to know how many patients are going to come through this and then to try to calculate, is this a positive revenue generating program or somewhere they have to move costs around to have, have this, this covered uh, outside of its direct revenue. So as you decide with the location and equipment, as this becomes important for your, your budget, the operating room, I think, is a no-go. There's limited advantages to performing it in the OR, and it's not cost-effective use of the space. You're doing a low-acuity procedure in a high-acuity space, and that could be used to, to generate more revenue. So this, I, I would not recommend saying you're going to do these in the operating room. Your endoscopy unit, it is an opportunity there to expand the number of endoscopies per day and to become more efficient. And here, you could use either the the bronchoscope or a tra transnasal gastroscope because you would already be using uh, your endoscopes in this location. If you want to move into an office location, again, you're going to have expanded number of endoscopies per day because you're not taking the existing, existing endoscopy slots. You have a new unique opportunity to perhaps blend clinic visits and a procedure on the same day. Our ENT colleagues do this all the time. So this is something that quite frankly can be done. You here, the advantage would be to use the transnasal uh, endoscopy gastroscope uh, because there's no need for high level disinfection. You would not need to transport the equipment uh, away from where you're, you're now performing it. And then again, the caution with the, 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 when you decide on this kind of space, if you propose this, the administrator is going to be really concerned if it's a hospital owned or doctor's owned space. Those are dis the kind of distinctions to where revenue is flowing. Uh, like at our institution, if I asked my call, like my junior partners, they would say, well, everything's hospital owned. Well, it's not. Some of our space is DO space, doctor's owned. Other is OH space, the hospital owned space. The hospital owned space, the hospital charges a facility fee and gains revenue that way. If it's in doctor's own space, you are not allowed to charge a facility fee. And so there's less revenue coming in to the hospital. Although doctor's charges are higher, it's not equivalent to what makes up in that space. So what about as you build the plan, are you gonna be able to, are you gonna propose that you're gonna be doing additional endoscopies then? Well, will you be performing a greater number of endoscopies on existing patients? There's less resistance to multiple endoscopies in EOE patients. Perhaps, you know, you, you will be able to do yearly endoscopies even on these patients as screening to assure that they continue to be in remission. Will you be performing endoscopies in patients that are already your patients who would otherwise not undergo a procedure, like for a repeated biopsy for H. pylori, persistent H. pylori infection? Do you anticipate an increase in patient referrals to your center? If no one else is doing this in your region, perhaps you will get more referrals. Will you have a decrease in the time from ordering endoscopy to its performance? Why is this important? Because again, you're increasing efficiency. You're, you're able to get patients in more quicker. There is evidence to show that shorter wait time can decrease the number of future cancellations. I looked at this in our institution, and if something is scheduled over several weeks, you start losing those patients. They either go to other centers or they cancel for various reasons and then reschedule later, it becomes a, quite frankly, a scheduling headache. But if you're able to get them in quicker, you have a greater chance of performing more procedures. 
And then an important part is, and I showed this slide before, but it's important to emphasize that you are moving patients out of a high acuity setting, the operating room, especially if you're moving from an operating room to an area that's low acuity. By doing that, you allow the operating room to add patients that have that are undergoing more complex procedures that are higher chargers and higher utilization. Your surgeons are gonna be thrilled if you open up more rooms for them to do more operations and your administrators will be too. This could be built into the budget if you talk about the numbers that you, you move out and then it makes it more likely that you're gonna see a positive uh, revenue stream from doing transnasal endoscopies. And then are there new opportunities that we haven't thought of? Screening for varices in patients that we may wait longer because we don't want to put them under sedation. Do more high risk patients, cardiac patients that are not, not uh, good candidates for anesthesia. Patients in the pediatric intensive care unit. Or you could actually start doing performance since you now are skilled with a thin, thin, uh, thin and endoscopes, performance through the gastrostomy. We, one of my colleagues at our institution performed uh, a, a using the EVO endoscope through the gastroscopy in, in a patient in the intensive care unit to evaluate if the patient had a proximal GI bleed to see if we had to take that patient who is high risk to the operating room for intervention. And then you transnasal endoscopy, unsedated, uh, sedation free can be used to assist in placement in transpyloric feeding tubes. And this may be an opportunity that it could be done on the floor or in a unit quite rapidly. And then you're going to decide, do you use a bronchoscope versus a transnasal gastroscope? Again, we talked about kind of where you could use these. One, it's you need to consider your availability of the equipment, number of scopes. If you're planning on doing a large number of transnasal endoscopies in a day with a rapid turnover, uh, bronchoscopes may you may not have enough bronchoscopes and and the inability to clean them rapidly to be able to turn them over. Again, do you have access to the high level disinfection? And then, what is your goal for evaluation? Is it just to investigate and biopsy the esophagus, or is your goal to reach the stomach and do a denum? Those help you decide: Do you need both of these scopes, or where, if you're doing in different locations, what do you need to build into your budget? Now, finally, we all, as we're building the budget, you need to know the codes, billing, and we're all interested, or many centers are interested in how it affects our work RVUs. So, one, there are codes for uh, the transnasal EGDs, and the codes are labeled as T codes. This is for a tracking code. And so, these are temporary codes that, uh, that are used that over time, these codes will change to full codes if, if they are used uh, more frequently. If they're not used, these codes will die out and then there'll be a struggle charging for these procedures. So this is important to, as we build these programs that we use these tracking, uh, these, these tracking codes. So here I just show a little bit of what the payments to the, uh, for some of these procedures. This is the national Medicare average payments. And here you have the facility payment. And here are the physician fees. And this is outpatient a hospital, like an operating room. Here would be a, a surgery center. And it's the same way set up over here. I have transnasal, transoral. The EGDs uh, or the um, esophagoscopies are in gray. And, and EGDs are in blue. And you can see the charges are not dramatically different from transoral to transnasal. So overall, we're not losing a significant amount of revenue by doing these procedures. There's some that are lower, but it's not it should not tremendously impact the, the revenue streams based upon the procedures itself. Again, Medicare average. And then if we look at uh, work RVUs, the the Transnasal EGDs do not have natural work RVUs uh, established yet. Our hospital looked at this and decided to add the same RVUs for, for our routine endoscopies. So 
So our physicians who do transnasal endoscopies do not lose work RVUs or in no way punished by deciding that they want to do upper endoscopies. And so training, the final step, how are you going to get your training? How are you going to do this to set it up? And so I think, quite frankly, to do training, um, you, you kind of want to have to decide first where you're going to obtain instruction and experience. Well, one, you could ask your ad adult gastroenterology colleagues. They will shake their head and say, we don't do it. So I, we, you know, very few, we've asked several when we first started thinking about this, we thought, oh, we'll go to our expert, you know, adult gastroenterologists who do, who are experts in Barrett's esophagus. They certainly do transnasal endoscopy because I read it in a book once. And you go and they look at you and say, no adult wants it. So they don't do very few adult gastroenterologists do, uh, do sedation-free transnasal endoscopy. Your center may be different, but again, that's different. Where you can get some experience, at least to see kind of how the patients are handled and how things are done, you could go to uh, the, your pediatric ENT clinic where, again, they just are looking in the upper airway, uh, but they do... A, a nice job of showing how they handle some of the patients. Now, quite frankly, they don't, in my experience, I don't see them using distraction. They just move and do it. The child's coughing, but they have a little quicker procedure and turnaround. But you could get comfortable by seeing how they do these procedures. You could easily go, you know, talk to a center that's performing these procedures and, and visit them and, and perhaps participate in some of the procedures there. Or work with Evo Endo. They do, do training sessions. They have a model that they bring in that is, is quite useful. And Dr. Friedlander does a fantastic job explaining how the model's different from a human and, and really getting you comfortable. Their team is very comfortable with handling the, the Evo Endo scope. In fact, we recently, our group recently did this, and you can see these are not patients that, that, We've actually did the program where people volunteered, our own colleagues volunteered to have that endoscopy done upon on themselves. So it was quite interactive and people got very comfortable with it. What was also nice is my colleagues, a faculty member said it was not that bad, that it was very tolerable to have the upper endoscopy done. And they were all thrilled that none of them had esophagitis. So, so they were very excited. So then at, once you, you know, are moving through with the train, who will be trained at your center? I think this becomes a, a difficult question, I think, in some areas. Is it your entire group or are there select, uh, you know, selected gastroenterologists who will be doing these? I think if you, it, again, it depends upon the size of your center, but you need to do enough of these just like any endoscopy. This is different from, uh, you know, sedated EGD. This takes some training and a skill set that you have to develop over time. And it's probably, you know, I don't know the numbers, but I would say 20 to 30 where you're saying I could do these with ease and not a problem. And, and if you're switching between scopes to the scopes act differently. So you need to have at least frequent use of transnasal uh, endoscopy to be comfortable with it. So as you start to grow, you could add people into your program, but it may be impossible to say, well, everyone's going to do a couple of these and you'll do one every other month. And I think that may not work. The fellows become very interested in this. We, we The way we have done this is that if our fellows want to train in it, that we will train them. They can participate in the, uh, during the endoscopy day that we have it. In fact, one of our senior fellows said that she, she, she has been doing several of these and she received a lot of positive feedback as she started applying for jobs where people are looking to hire her. You know, I think everyone want, thinks the places that don't have the programs or are expanding the programs want to bring in more people. And I think fellows are going to start hearing about that and will likely um, uh, start asking to be trained too. So that's all I have to present right now. And I, we're, we're open for questions. If anyone go ahead and we could uh, answer whatever you want or go in whatever, what, whatever direction you want to go into. All right, well, great. So we actually do have a few questions that have come in. So I'll just go ahead and start firing them off. And um, 
the first question is, you know, Dr. S directed to you, Dr. Safera, how would you select your first faculty member to be performing this uh, sedation-free endoscopy procedure? Yeah, so it was interesting. So we, I, I actually, uh, when we started this, it was with my, uh, one of our junior faculty members. It was Dr. Save. He came out of our fellowship program. And it was the first couple years of his time in, you know, as a faculty member, he was a, quite a skilled endoscopist and was very interested in doing endoscopy. The key to him was he was in our aerodigestive clinic. It starts to, uh, beginning to develop that program, one of the initial docs in our program. And so this seemed to be a nice fit that we said, hey, you have the interest, you are, uh, you, you, you have the energy to go ahead and develop it. And then he really took it from there and ran with it. And quite interesting to think back, we struggled with a lot of different, you know, of course at that time, uh, the Colorado group was starting to come out. I think we heard a couple of their early presentations. And then finally where their paper came out, we tried to reproduce what they did. And it took a while to get it up and running. But I think a lot of it is if you have, it would be a faculty member who would be interested and then would would be able to dedicate time to being trained in it. Because I think if you have someone who doesn't have the time, they could fail rapidly if they have a bad outcome initially, and then your program's not going to get started. All right, very good. So uh, we we actually have a couple that just came in uh, and some additional ones. So the first is kind of a hot topic um, among us lately internally. So what is your workflow? for deciding between using a bronchoscope versus the transnasal um, gastroscope? And what are your percentages of bronchoscopes versus t and &E gastro gastroscopes? Right, so our, our workflow, we are just becoming more comfortable with using the evoendoscope because it is different. You know, the, if you trained with a bronchoscope, the first time you use the Evo endoscope, you're going to say, nope, I can't do this. Because I think it takes a little bit of effort to learn how to handle the scope. Once you start doing that and you become very comfortable with it, I think you, you'll just roll right with it. We are, um, we're slowly increasing our percentage. We were probably, when we first looked at, when we last looked at, still 90% bronchoscope, although we're moving away from that pretty rapidly as we are, are saying many of our patients that we want to do more than EOE, uh, endoscopy for EOE screening, we want to be able to go in and then patients with uh, uh, other eosinophilic uh, gastrointestinal disorders in the proximal GI tract to go in and screen those, placing the NG tubes. So we're starting to expand that more. So the workflow is basically now the, the two docs in the group that are doing all of the transnasal work make the decision on their own, but it's based upon the patient and what our goal is. We have both, like our setup is designed, we can use either or scope. All right, great, thanks so much. And just a quick reminder for the audience, if you wanna kind of follow up to any of our responses or you wanna ask a question live, you can go ahead and type in the Q&A um, icon or raise your hand and I can unmute you and we can have a back and forth if you'd like to go that route as well. Um, the next question, uh, how do you start this in a small private practice? And do you know anyone who has used it in this setting? So Dr. Friedlander should probably answer that too. If he, but I, I would say it's it's probably easier to do this in a private practice setting in that if, if and this is unbiased, I th if you are going to use the transnasal gastroscope, since it is disposable, since it is can be done in a clinic, you would be able to just set this up with minimal startup costs and minimal effort to get this rolling. Because as we 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 were looking at our charges, we went back and looked at our charges, and our administrators are still working it through. But when you come through with this, we are the revenue stream is positive using the transnasal gastroscope on our patients. And Joel. 
Um, as of right now, I'm not aware of any private practices that are using transnasal endoscopy. And I think that's more related to the economics from your slides a little bit in the past, Dr. Sfera, of the reimbursement in the hospital facility versus the ambulatory surgery center space versus the outpatient. So the economics in a private practice model are very different than in a hospital. And every private practice has different economics about that. We've had quite a bit of interest from there, um, but at least knowing in the different types of sedation-free endoscopy, most of the sedation-free endoscopy that I'm aware of in the private practice space is in the ENT space. I don't know as much of it in the GI space right now. But great question, Dr. Tibley. Hello. Hi, yes, go ahead. So I'm, I'm the one who asked the question. So I'm in private practice, so I have less uh, people to answer to, but also have a yeah. lot less money to play with. Um, is there any way I can be trained and someone can, you know, I don't mind being the first place that this can be started if I can be offered this for, you know, for, you know, for training and stuff. So I, is that something you guys might consider? If yes, let me know. Dr. Jibbelli, um, I will. I can contact you offline. I'm definitely happy to talk to you about all that stuff and have our team speak to you about that as well too. But we're definitely okay. happy to offer training and work with you as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. All right, great. Um, another question: Can you describe the training a bit further in order to achieve competency? What is the ability to obtain duodenal biopsies versus gastric biopsies versus esophageal biopsies in terms of level of difficulty? So, so that was a long one. So let's right. so, yeah. so Dr. Free, let, oh, yeah, can you describe the training a bit further in order to achieve competency? So we'll start with that piece first, and then so, we'll address the second piece. So I'm just going to describe again how we did the training uh, again the the I think the level the numbers for competency Dr. Friedlander probably is better because he would have discussed this with multiple centers because I think it's going to be endoscopist dependent but again we started with using the bronchoscope and it initially a lot of the training was done you know uh, uh, we did they are the endoscopy, we essentially scoped each other. And then when we um, were able to, we talked to our initial patients and some of the patients, we, we explained to them what we were doing. It was a novel procedure. And just to avoid the anesthesia, they essentially volunteered to undergo this type of procedure. So, so we were able to slowly gain competency. We actually gained the ones who didn't start in the early days, who started later now that are doing the transnasal endoscopy, had a more, I think, uh, straightforward path where Evo Endo team came in, used their model to teach us how to, to navigate through the nares, through the upper upper pharynx, and to, to do transnasal endoscopy. And then, again, worked on some live models and then moved into patients. And then Dr. Friedland, you could probably discuss more about the the numbers that people are saying they need to achieve competency. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that for that question, um, Dr. Chipatazi, and for your answer, Dr. Sfera. So, um, training in transnasal endoscopy has actually been around for. Um, quite some time. And if we actually look back to the literature back from the early 90s, um, adult training of the original ultrasound endoscopes generally showed master endoscopists somewhere between 10 and 20 generally achieve basic competency relatively quickly. As a transnasal endoscopist, I can say being competent and being fully comfortable are two totally different concepts. So I would say <laughs> What I have seen in the field working with multiple centers, some that have used bronchoscopes like uh, Dr. Sferas at Rainbow Babies, others that started fresh with the Evo Endo gastroscope, generally somewhere between zero and five, you achieve some basic competency with relatively trained endoscopists. So endoscopists that again, get there. Some after a first couple do okay. And then somewhere between five and 20, they kind of achieve, hey, I got this. Um, I'd say the average is somewhere between 10 and 15 and some people closer to 15 to 20. And then after that, it's just, you kind of get over it and get better and better. Um, but it's that you have to do it in a relatively 
frequent uh, process. So as Dr. Sferis said beautifully, you know, if you do one of these every two months, imagine any of us went back to fellowship and we were learning endoscopy by doing an EGD every two months. You just don't learn it. Endoscopy with sedation free has two components. We kind of split it up into what we call room management and procedural management. And there's two components of that because we're not used to working with sedation free patients. And we also have to learn how to navigate a three and a half millimeter endoscope, which we all like, oh, it's just like our nine millimeter endoscopes. It's not, it's a little bit different. So the short answer is between five and 20 um, would be kind of where you get there. Um, and most people, again, after five, are like, hey, I got this. And then you kind of get over your nerves between that five and the 15 mark when you do them at that good regular free frequency every couple of weeks, not that once every three months kind of process. Um, in regards to the other questions in terms of esophagus, gastric, and duodenal, what we've seen, um, depending on the endoscopist and different things, most people pick up the esophagus pretty quickly because it's like dropping an NG tube, going directly to the stomach, same kind of stuff. Getting to the duodenum, it's actually more related to the patient position. So a lateral position or a supine position is what we're used to. So our instincts as endoscopists um, are like, hey, where are, things are going left versus right because they're in different position. When we've watched transnasal sedation free endoscopists do a lateral, they're like, oh, I know where the positions are. When you're in sitting, which is how I was trained, you can get there, but it takes a little bit more of learning where you're where the where the anatomy is, which isn't hard, it just takes a little bit longer. But we've had some endoscopists literally on their first time said, I want to go to the duodenum, and they're in the duodenum on their first scope. It just takes them a little bit longer, but they pick it up pretty quickly as they go as well, too. Does that answer your question, Dr. Chipotazzi? Okay. He said yes, thank you. Okay. Um, we have another question. Uh, training on live models with a single-use T&E gastroscope seems expensive. So what is the best cost-effective way to train providers and fellows on the Evo Endo system? And there is actually, before we answer, there was another question that, that was inquiring about cost as well. Um, that is something that, you know, we would be happy to discuss with you offline. Um, but uh, go ahead and so training on live models with, with a single use gas, gastroscope, how can we do this cost effectively? So I'll open that up to both of you. You need a donor. No, <laughs> donate them. Dr. Friedlander, I'll let you answer that. Um, so thanks so much for asking that, Dr. Odiasi. So from our perspective as a company, yeah. as I was mentioning before, we are very committed to sedation-free endoscopy and letting people understand the experience, learn how to train. So as a company for training, as a company, we are happy to offer those scopes for those live hands-on purposes. So those are not considered as part of any purchase that is made, but as part of when you um, are part of the Evo Endo family, the Evo Endo system, we are happy to help provide those scopes for training um, if your hospital allows it in those live models. So not every medical center will allow what Dr. Sfera was showing. Some do, some don't. And obviously you always want to make sure to check with your hospital or medical center. Um, but as a as a program with a purchase, we are happy to help with that hands-on live training models and the devices with them as well. And Dr. Odiasi, I would say yes to that question as well, too. <laughs> so and, she uh, asked. Yeah. Um, so she was asking in subsequent years if fellows wanted to do hands-on live training, would we be open to that? The answer is yes as well. All right, great. Um, so for the patient. Is nasal insertion of the gastroscope the most uncomfortable? Once through the nasal passages and into the esophagus, does the discomfort stabilize or decline? And lastly, what do you use for local anesthetic? So what our patients have relayed to us, and again, you know, I'm not the one doing the transnasals in our program, but it is the the most uncomfortable time is when it's being inserted. But I'm I'm going to say uncomfortable because it's more of a pressure sensation because there is a local anesthetic that takes away the pain when you are inserting it, and then the technique comes in if you perform it in using the right technique. Once you get through the the nasal passage there should be minimal pain and, and discomfort. And again, it matters. This is where, since the patient is not sedated, you have to be aware how you're holding the scope, the position that the, the tube is transversing through the nares, 
so it doesn't cause pain and tug in the wrong position. And Joe, I'll let you expand upon that. Uh, I think that's a fantastic answer is so if the technique is good going from the nose along the inferior turbinate past the adenoids, it's usually, you know, one to two seconds, if that, um, but it's a very gliding technique. Again, once you become expert at kind of how you're doing it. Um, but again, if you start navigating and don't know exactly where you're going, quite a bit of nasal pressures in there. With that said, most stocks are doing pretty good relatively quickly with that. The next part is the UES. Um, and that's the next hardest part to train the docs on um, is the, and we usually recommend practicing with NG tube placement or impedance pro placement is a great way to learn that feel. But to your question about what does it feel like once you get down, once you're through the UES to the mid esophagus, most of the sensations disappear where you just feel a little bit of pressure in your nose or throat, like, ooh, something's in there, my throat's numb, it kind of feels strange. And then the only time that really patients feel much else, and again, every patient is a little bit different. So it's, I can't, I say, generally there's some patients that hate it, some people that have no feeling. Most people will tell you they have some pressure in there, um, is when you're doing a lot of motion in the nose, like Dr. Sparrow was talking about. So once it's in, if your technique is doing all this kind of stuff, they feel those in the nose. If it's a nice gliding technique, then generally it's a pretty comfortable procedure for the patient. I wouldn't say that they love it. It's a, it's still a medical procedure where most patients do pretty good and they tolerate it. And as Dr. Sfera showed in those pictures last week, uh, when we were doing that training course, uh, most of the docs that had it done would kind of tell you the same thing at that time. And then the last piece is what do you use for local anesthetic? So right, Joe, what are most people? Yeah, what are yeah. most people using, Joe? There's there's really a wide um, a wide variation across centers, but we've seen anything from two percent to four percent lidocaine. Some places use gel in the nose, but if you use the two percent gel in the nose, obviously you have to make sure it sits for a little while and then empty the nose out. Um, but some centers have some great success with that. Some use some four percent lidocaine. Um, we've seen doses between one and a half up to five mLs of lidocaine. It's usually dose dependent based upon the size of the patient. Some do some installation in the nose and the throat. Some just do some installations in the nose. It kind of varies. I've seen some centers actually use some hurricane spray, but that's stung a little bit more, so they stop that as well. Yeah. Um, but there's really, there's wide varieties. Um, there's also some ENT techniques where they actually use that lidocaine and they put it on some pledgets and just kind of leave it in the nose for a while. And you can see some old ENT and transnasal techniques like that as well. So basically there's probably about 10 different ways you can numb up the nose, but um, it, a lot of it depends on style. Some docs like, hey, I really like it this way and they do it this way. Some want to try something else, but um, we're happy to connect you to different centers and the different styles and experiences. Um, here's, here's more of a kind of logistical and practice question. Um, how did you protect your faculty's time to learn this new technique and technology and ensure that they had enough patience to become proficient and confident? How much time did they need during this process? And that would be to Dr. Safera. Yeah. So protecting time, as you know, is, is very difficult. And we, you know, so we were fortunate enough to have a day already set aside when we first started for Dr. Sabe for aerodigestive diseases. And we were doing operating room. He was doing cases there. And so during that day, in between the endoscopies for the aero patients, we were able to do transnasal endoscopies up in our endoscopy unit. So he was able to flip up either if this it was scheduled, you know, in the half day or whatever, he was able to, to move and do those additional procedures. So he had the protected time for being part of the aerodigestive team to do that. Um, we And to get enough patients, we had to work with the rest of our staff to be able to be comfortable knowing what the procedure was, what kind of so we could start everyone in clinic then were sending him patients that are, are we had a, a, a EOE clinic, which, which was run by a different physician who then was very comfortable with talking to the patients about saying if they wanted sedation-free endoscopy, then sending them to Dr. Uh, to Dr. Sabe to get that going. So now as we transition to having additional docs, it's again our aerodigestive team that has had the most free time to do it. And, we're, and we now have most of us are offering in clinic when we say you need your follow-up endoscopy for EOE to send, send them there. And then I've been a strong advocate 
for whatever, you know, if we're finding something like I said in the PICU or if someone has, you know, eosinophilic esophago gastroduodenitis and they need follow up to kind of get those involved in, in it. So you need the advocates within your group to do that, to get enough patients before it starts uh, the, the program to build. Then um, Dr. Safera, you know, have you seen any serious complications like perforations or anything else during this kind of rollout of uh, this teeny program there at your hospital? Yeah, so I could talk again at our institution. We had um, one patient who had a nosebleed. It was in we not. It was early in the, in the initial trials that our, that we were doing, and so did have a nosebleed. Bleed. It was with the bronchoscope, and then that required you know some pressure and resolved, and the patient was discharged with no problem. And we had one patient who complained of pain. But I believe that the procedure needed to be discontinued. Um, the other thing that we did notice, and in when we really looked at many patients had what appeared to be a elevated blood pressure, some of them, and we and we think it was purely based upon their um, fear of under, uh, unknown, because it would seem to track with those patients and even patients would have it before even undergoing the procedure. So it was it was one of those things. So so no real, I'm not aware of anyone with a perforation or any other complication other than the nosebleed with that. Right, very good. And then um, the next question is, you know, what was your experience with the value analysis committee or VAT committee? And, uh, you know, can you kind of, give a little insight into what your role was during that process versus your faculty member's role um, in working with them to bring, um, you know, this program to life at your facility. Right. So we had to work closely with our administrators. And because, again, it we we anticipated a rel relatively low volume. Um, but our the way we were able to show that this was revenue positive, which was that we were moving cases out of the operating room and doing them in a different location. And that was the main key to us being able to move this forward. As we go forward, I think as we start to expand it and do additional procedures that we would anticipate, like doing more frequent screening for varices or even placement of nasogastric tubes. We, at our institution, we are, uh, our interventional radiologist handed off the role of uh, trans nasal, nasal enteral, you know, transpyloric tubes. So we do those and we essentially have done uh, do them blindly. Uh, when a patient has it, now we're, we have another means of doing them, which is it, it actually increases the, the, the revenue because we're doing a endoscopy at the same time. Awesome. Um, can you describe the logistics in patient recruitment of your own institution's EOE patients as you launched your new transnasal endoscopy program? So that's the first part, and I'll kind of leave it there, and then we'll go into the second part of the question. So again, we got buy-in from all our physicians and our EOE doc that this was a good program and would be an advantage to their patients. So it was being offered then to our patients um, just because we, we find, and I think everyone knows this, that if your primary doctor recommends you get something in this manner, patients will go likely will accept that recommendation. And so if you said, no, don't do it, they're not going to do it. But we had buy-in that this would be something that they would want to do. And then also the our institution put out some social media posts and some other things with a video of patients, you know, a video with a patient describing it and stuff that then patient, we were able to refer patients to that. And even on our webpage, I believe it probably still up that we have a uh, transnasal, a video about transnasal endoscopy. And so that's how patients became comfortable with it. And it was able to, to continue to grow. 
Right. And and that kind of actually touches, it seems to be on the second part of um, this question, but um, the second part was subsequently marketing to outside facilities to, or how did you market to outside facilities to advertise for sedation-free endoscopy? Right. I, I think it's social media. I think families, <laughs> that's where, that's where young parents now are getting their information. And so our institution really has pushed out that we have a transnasal and a robust aerodigestive and EOE program on social media. And I think that's how, you know, our, our goal is to get refer, you know, self-referrals or patients asking to, to have it done by their physicians or their GI docs at other centers. All right, very good. Um, thank you for that question. Um, so we're, we're up on the top of the hour. I do have, a, you know, one or two more questions, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, but if anyone needs to drop off, that's fine. Just know that you'll get a recording of this uh, video session um, after um, it is closed. So this next question comes in from the audience. It says, um, let's see, uh, your thoughts and comments to a recent report from a GI academic group in Wales that TNE is undiagnosing and, and and that was in quotes, Barrett's that was incorrectly diagnosed via sedated oral EGD due to retching. That's an interesting question. What do you guys think? I have not seen that report, so I'll have to think about that. Joel, and any thoughts? I haven't seen the specific article, um, but I know and again, I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, and we don't see a lot of Barrett's in the in the pediatric world as they do in the adult world. Um, I would like to take a look at the article. Um, I could say, after doing many hundreds of transnasal endoscopies, is that it the visualization is really good, but a high definition scope is going to be different than a three millimeter scope, no matter how we look at it. And Barrett's, I know, is very dependent on visualization, narrow band imaging, as well as biopsy proving it that it's there. Um, and so I'd have to look at it and see kind of how they're diagnosing or undiagnosing it based upon using a slimmer scope compared to a wider scope in a sedated versus a sedation free environment. So unfortunately, I don't have any specific thoughts, but um, I'd have to look at the article to get more specifics from there. But I know the adults that I've worked with Barrett's is very much a a visual super high definition kind of concept with biopsy proving it so they have a suspicion and then need a biopsy to prove it so I'm not so sure how TNE would change that so I'd have to look at the article to see what's going on okay. um one last question I think we'll take and then we'll wrap up here um I just I just want to kind of address this one so regarding post pyloric feeding tube placement is this done currently with the Evo endoscope if so, I was curious about the cost comparison of post pyloric feeding tube placement by the GI service versus placement by IR. And uh, so, you know, I'll kind of open this up to you guys, but I just kind of wanted to put put a little plug in here just to kind of, you know, as you guys are thinking about rolling out these programs, um, you know, these expanded ind indications are things that we are very closely looking at. Um, so this so this is something that we are evaluating currently, um, just so you guys know. Um, and so, but um, I'll kind of get the floor or open the floor up to the both of you, and then we'll wrap up on that uh, question. So they w are done with the Evo endoscope because that helps you guide it as you're in in the stomach and to help visualize as you're going through the the pylorus. I don't have an idea of the comparison between GI doing it and, and IR. Like you said, we um, it's our responsibility to perform the the transpyloric feeding tubes now. That, and and so if if we're having trouble doing it without visualization, we don't do it um, under fluoroscopy. We'll place the tube and then get an X-ray, try to maneuver the tube and get an X-ray. And so sometimes that is quite difficult. And so it would be the only way we could get a place at our institution at the at this moment. Very good. So I just kind of wanted to kind of conclude this session with this one last just kind of request from you, Dr. Safara. If you could just briefly share with us, um, you know, how how the implementation of this program and this procedure. 
uh, thus far has impacted your your practice. So your cl your clinical productivity of your faculty, their satisfaction with their role within the division, um, and the economic impact overall for both you know your 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 practice and your patients. So I I could say one the excitement that it has generated by doing a new technique, a new endoscopic technique, uh, really has invigorated the physicians in my group. Everyone is always excited to, you know, to doing it. People, uh, a good turnout in the training programs. Everyone wants to get a hand on the scope. The docs who are doing it are very excited about doing the procedures. So I think that's a positive thing because we all know we're under always under a lot of stress just being seeing people being happy and and wanting to see new equipment is is, is a great benefit um we uh, you know unfortunately i'm in the process of doing we finally probably achieved enough and uh transnasal endoscopies and since we've had dr sabi and now two additional doctors who were doing them that we have enough for a comparison of how this affects our um, productivity, but what I could say is just there had those who are doing these procedures, and when Dr. Sabe had done them for four years, yeah, four years at our institution, there was he did not lose any productivity overall in what he was doing. Um, so I anticipate it's going to come out as as a kind of a neutral, you know, and, uh, no loss and. and and not a significant gain because again, there it's if you're just looking at one person's productivity, that's not going to change because they only could do the one scope. But I think for the division, our numbers of scopes have been slowly increasing for transnasal endoscopy, and I don't get this, and I know they're not decreasing our numbers uh, of sedated endoscopies, but that could be a growth phenomenon too. So I don't know. All right. Well, Dr. Safira, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to spend with us and talk on this topic um, with us today or this evening. Um, as a reminder, to, again, to everyone, we will be sending out the recording of this webinar via email in the coming days. Um, for more information or to get in touch with your team, please stop by our website, www.evoendo.com. That's E-V-O. Endo.com. Um, thank you again, and everyone have a wonderful, wonderful night.